Yeah, I tricked you. Here's everybody else. It is over here. Can we just all be together? But no, we can't. Because why? I don't know. Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about my favorite trilogies. My rule for myself with this is that the trilogy both has to be finished and I have to have finished it. Necessarily there are things that are not on this list because they are not completed trilogies by the author. I have not completed reading them or needless to say some of my favorite books are not trilogies. <laughs> I have a list of 10 and I did actually rank them this time so instead of my usual they're in no particular order they are in a particular order. It was really tough to rank them so some of the middle of this ranking is uh like could be you know the order could be shifted. I'm not 100 on kind of the, the middle portion but the top and the bottom the bottom of my top 10 are pretty set. So we're gonna start with 10th, the least best. Number 10 on my list is The Infernal Devices by Cassandra Clare. Don't click away. I have other series on this list. <laughs> I unironically, unapologetically love The Infernal Devices. Is Cassandra's Clare writing style kind of ridiculous? Yes it is. Is this book series kind of ridiculous? Yes it is. <laughs> is it the best thing that I've ever read? No it's not. That's why it's 10th on the list. But credit where it's due, I've rarely read anything more compelling. My feelings were very feelingy. I bawled my eyes out when I was reading in particular the third one. To this day I would die for Jem Carstairs and to this day I have never read another love triangle that is really a true triangle like this that I found compelling and, and well written and believable. And a true triangle in the sense of all three of these people love each other. It's not a girl choosing between one bad boy and another slightly different bad boy. It's not a girl choosing between the bad boy and the friend that was always there for her. No, these two boys love each other. These two boys love her and she loves these two boys. It's a lot of selfless love. What, what they want for each other is happiness. So. Of course the one wants the other to have the girl and be with her because he loves his friend and he loves this girl and he wants them to be happy and the other feels the exact same way and she loves them both and loves that they love each other and doesn't want to come between them. So there's a lot of pain. So much pain. <laughs> Mainly I kept thinking why can't all of y'all just be a thruple? Why can't y'all just be together? All three of you. Because y'all love each other so much. No one has to lose. Just get a big house and live together. But no, set in a Victorian era, so we didn't do that. <laughs> so much pain. And I mean, I like Will too. I don't dislike him, but Jem, 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 Jem. I mean, I was rooting for Jem. I was mainly rooting for all three of them and I was like, can we just all be together? But no, we can't, because why? I don't know. But if we can't all three be together, which is my favorite option, but if that's not an option, which apparently it's not, then I I'm rooting for Jem. <laughs> so should you read it? I mean, if you like pain, I do think the characters are compellingly written. The magic stuff, the political political stuff, like the plot stuff is, is it, it's I, it's not the best kind of, some of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, random MacGuffins and silly magic rules and arbitrary things. Like it's, it's not great, but the emotional journeys of these three characters wrecked me. Wow, that's why it's number 10 on the list. <laughs> number nine on my list is The Mistborn Trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, you heard me, that's correct. It is allowed to be on my list because the majority of that trilogy I enjoyed the heck out of and thought was top quality. I really, really enjoyed The Final Empire. I gave The Well of Ascension five full-hearted, full-hearted, is that a phrase? Full-hearted? Why can't you say full-hearted? It means the same thing. Stars. <laughs> I didn't love the way that it ended, which is why my notorious now taken down video was made. Because as always, as I've said many times, I post so many rant reviews because I like to like what I read and I expect to love everything that I read and I get very upset and angry when I don't love what I read, hence the ranting, because it's an emotional reaction of immense disappointment. I can't be disappointed by something if I didn't expect great things. It's because I expect great things that I am so disappointed and therefore angry. So because I really, really liked Final Empire and really, really liked Will of Ascension, I felt quite let down by the end of the trilogy. But nevertheless, for the majority of the runtime, I really, really enjoyed it. And I still think a lot of its strengths are there. They're not entirely ruined. Some of it, a little bit. It's not like all that great work. It's not like all of the things that I did think were original and compelling, unique and thought provoking 
are just gone because of how it ended, because of the answer to some of the questions posed by the beginning and uh, middle of the trilogy. Would I have preferred it to end differently? Would I have preferred the message to be a bit different? Yes, hence that video. But I did really, really like that trilogy. I just preferred to ignore how it ended. <laughs> the second book in particular, Chef's Kiss, that was incredibly compelling and unique and immersive, and I'm very proud of myself for guessing the twist. <laughs> Number eight on my list is The Winner's Trilogy by Mary Rutkowski. Part of the reason this is on here, a large part of the reason why this is on here, is that I have seldom read anything that was as just compulsively readable. Every time I picked up one of the books in that trilogy, I just could not put it down. The unput downableness of those books, I don't know why or what it is, or how it is, or anything. But something about Mary Rukowski's writing style I, is unputdownable. And it's not because like every page ends with a cliffhanger or anything. I mean, there is some of that. I just, I, I'm just gobbling it up. Like I'm gulping it down. I can't read it fast enough. So credit where it's due. That's impressive. I mean, I really hate the covers, both versions, the original hardcovers and the paperbacks, because I think they do an immense disservice to the impression they give people of what this trilogy is like. The covers make it look like, I don't even know, they make it look like it's like The Bachelorette or Throne of Glass. <laughs> it is like neither. This is a series with a lot of political intrigue, quite a bit of war, particularly by, uh, by the end of it. Very low magic. There's a really clever of her heroine who is not some badass assassin going around killing people. She's also not a flighty, flirty girl wearing ball gowns every goddamn day. She's an intelligent and savvy political thinker. She's not a Mary Sue. She's not amazing at everything. She, there are some things she's good at. It's a sort of enemies to lovers, but it's not a tropey cliche one. These are two people coming from very different political social backgrounds. And so that makes this awkward. <laughs> it creates real problems because of where they've, where they've come from and what their priorities are and how they would ordinarily be in opposition to each other. But because they respect each other as humans and, and they respect each other in terms of intellect, personality, and even morality, they find common ground. But nevertheless, because of where they've come from, this is really very tricky and creates a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication, and impossibility between them, which is a political impossibility. And so there's a lot of political maneuvering and political navigating on both their parts. And they're really complex, layered individuals with compelling stories and and you really root for them, at least I did. And I think that, again, the readability of it, I mean, I was just chewing my way through it and I just had to keep going. I thought they were really, really well done. And I really feel like those covers need to go. <laughs> Number seven on my list is The Winter Night Trilogy by Catherine Arden. This I just finished. <laughs> While I did find the ending to be less than completely satisfying. I do think it's an immense achievement and a really great trilogy. The work that she has done to research and to include really, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but as far as I can tell, and then my impression of it is that it's fairly authentically Russian, transliterated Russian words, Russian names, Russian history, Russian politics, Russian culture, Russian food, Russian vibes to the max. But it's not just, you know, a grand old mishmash of Russianish stuff. It's a really compelling story with an amazing main character. I love Vasya so much. Vasya is an amazing main character. She's not typical in any way. <laughs> she's not the most beautiful maiden in all the land. She's not like a stabby assassin. She's not wildly flirtatious. She's not super sassy and sarcastic. She's just strong and independent and knows her own mind. She is flawed. She makes mistakes. She pays for those mistakes. Her strong will can turn into stubbornness. She's not by no means a perfect character, but she is a confident and compelling and independent and fantastic character. And like a lot of the strength of this trilogy is just how amazing Vasya is as a character. And then, I mean, all the Russian folkloric elements are just so lush and so wonderful to be immersed in. There's a lot of other characters in it as well, not just Vasya. Her family and the magical creatures around her are also heartwarming and endearing and interesting to read about. The love story element of it is not my favorite. Even that is handled in a way that like, I'll allow it. I think it's done as good as I guess it could be done uh, in this situation. I would just prefer it to not really be a thing, but if it's gonna be a thing, that's as good as I could really hope for it to be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just, it's lush and evocative and beautiful and it's fantastic. So good. Number six on my list is The Farseer Trilogy by Robin Hobb, which also I quite recently finished. And Robin Hobb, where you been all my life, girl? You've been writing books, but <laughs> why wasn't I reading them? Robin Hobb's storytelling is also incredibly compelling, immersive. She writes 
characters in a way that has your whole heart. I've, I think I've said a lot that a lot of characters have my whole heart. My heart belongs to so many. <laughs> but as I've said also now in a few videos and I've talked with a few people about this that like there is a sort of grimdark quality to the stories and the worlds that she's written and yet because it's told from the perspective and through the lens of a really naive and idealistic character then the books themselves could never really be shelved in grimdark because their tone is not grimdark. But the occurrences, what goes down, what people are up to around Dear Sweet Fitz is pretty freaking grimdark, on par with anything you'd read in an Abercrombie book. It's just that there's this sort of uplifting quality to having the story told from the perspective of Fitz that makes it not grimdark. But it is layered and complex and it is thought-provoking. The characters are three-dimensional and the world feels truly lived in and lush and so it's so good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm quite staggered and I mean I, everyone has you know, been praising Robin Hobb so I expected good things but I, just, I wasn't ready for how good her writing is and I am so excited to read more from Robin Hobb but the Farseer trilogy which I have completed. Most excellent. Five on my list is The Conqueror Saga by Kirsten White. This I haven't talked about in a minute. This is a reimagining retelling alternate history about Vlad the Impaler if Vlad the Impaler had been a girl. Lada Dragulia. And Lada has a lot in common with Vasya, honestly. If you like Vasya from the Winter Night trilogy, then I recommend the Conqueror Saga because Lada is, she's definitely got Vasya vibes. Um, this is also just a staggering achievement in terms of, again, this research that was done into the politics and history surrounding the life of Vlad the Impaler. It is a really sweeping, epic story. It is not just told from Lada's perspective, it is also told from the perspective of her brother, Radu. There is a uh, queer romance in it. The world, I mean, I hesitate, to say, I hesitate to say world because this is an alternate history, so it's not a fantasy world invented by Kirsten White, but the setting she places you in, her writing is very lush and evocative. You really feel like you're placed in Wallachia and in Constantinople, and you, like, a lot of it is, it is just so viscerally written. All the, the feelings are at the surface, and it's it's passionately written and there is violence and there is heartbreak there is betrayal cities are falling and our armies are sweeping across the land people are being impaled but she's written a character in lada that is is far from perfect is is definitely not a cleaned up version of vlad the impaler lada does some truly reprehensible things but this added element of a woman in a man's world kind of not justifying a lot of the barbaric things that lada does but it it gives it a new flavor because there's this added element of what a woman has to do in order to make it in a man's world, that she cannot choose the benevolent path because that is regarded as weakness in a woman. Where a man would be seen as being kind, a woman would be seen as being weak. And so that does change things in terms of like, if Vlad the Impaler had been a woman, it would kind of change the why of why these things, how this is going down, why those choices would be made. So that does affect it. And in a way that is compelling and thought provoking. And it is well done. It is so well done. And frankly, the end of the Conqueror Saga, the third book, is one of the best endings to a trilogy that I've read. I frequently said that the second books of trilogies are often my favorite, but in this instance, Kirsten White stuck the landing. The end of the Conqueror Saga is a perfect ending. That trilogy is just so, so fucking good. <laughs> Number four on my list is the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy by Lainey Taylor. It always astounds me that there isn't a name for this trilogy. I wish it had a name. I don't know what I'd call it. The Chimera trilogy? That's what I'd call it. <laughs> um, Lainey Taylor's writing is just wow. You want beautiful prose, Lainey Taylor's your gal. Daughter of Smoke and Bone in particular, the first book, I have rarely read something that is just such a immersive mind-body experience. Uh, when I read Daughter of Smoke and Bone, I felt like I had like lived a thing. Coming out of that book felt like I was like coming up for air. It is such an intense experience, the way her writing puts you not just in the headspace of a character, but in the feelings of that character, where like you are feeling the feelings. And it's even more staggering because the things going on you couldn't possibly relate to. They are the most whimsical, magical, bizarre, otherworldly things. Honestly, if anyone adapted this, it would probably look stupid as hell because it would be really difficult to make this amount of magicalness not look stupid. <laughs> the most extra and magical. And yet the feelings in it are so raw and so human. 
and so deeply felt and so incredibly viscerally <laughs> described to you, the reader, that you can't help but feel like gut punched by them. And it's all, but it's also so, so beautiful. You just like can't look away. Uh, it just grips you and then squeezes your heart. <laughs> it is fantastic. And then the back of the international edition, there's a blurbed quote from Patrick Rothfuss that just says, I wish I had written this book from Patrick Roth. So don't think you can get really a much higher accolade than that. And uh, I second that, sir. That book is an achievement. And the trilogy is really good. I, I think the third book in the trilogy is the weakest, which is often what I think. But it's still, the trilogy as a whole is fantastic. And the second book is, is really, really, really good. Um, the first book's probably my favorite, but it is an excellent trilogy and I highly recommend it. Number three on my list is the Raven's Mark trilogy by Ed McDonald. This series is so underhyped and underrated. I never see anybody talking about it, like ever at all. Breaks my heart. I've talked about it a few times because I will keep talking about it. Well, mainly I just talk about things I love, but also in particular that because like freaking read it guys what are you doing um the raven's mark trilogy is is grimdark as all hell if you don't like grimdark or you're on the fence about grimdark or you only like to dip your toes in the water of grimdark a bit maybe don't read the raven's mark trilogy it's pretty grim as grim as grim gets really but i think it is excellent and it has an element that a lot of fantasy doesn't have and that is a really true political conspiracy, not espionage, but yeah, conspiracy kind of plot that is reminiscent to me of like a Jean Le Carré kind of plot. Blending grim dark with this sort of political intrigue is just, it's so compelling and so great. You have your rough main character who works for this godlike entity, Crowfoot, who's one of the nameless ones. He's got a raven tattooed on him. Whenever Crowfoot has instructions for Rihal Galharo, an actual raven bloodily explodes out of his tattoo to squawk instructions at him. Day to day, Rihalt Galharo's job is ferrying, I say ferrying, but guiding people across this like nuclear fallout vibes zone called the Misery, which is this like death magic zone that was left over from like a sort of godlike war that occurred where it's very much that like nuclear vibes where like we pulled out all the stops and the land suffered for it. And now the reason there isn't war anymore is because there's mutually assured destruction. Because there is an engine that is like this basically doomsday device that's keeping the other side at bay. But you still have this nuclear fallout zone that people have to get across. And there are creatures that are warped by the toxic magic that is like seeped into the land there. So crossing it is dangerous for your health. <laughs> so Rihal is like feeling the wear and tear of that. He has a background that is obscure at first, so there's obviously more to him and how he came to both work for Crowfoot and also be working as this guide. There's more to him and his story and how he ended up here. But in his job, ferrying people and working for Crowfoot, he comes to realize or is made aware of the fact that something is up with the government. Things are not as they should be. People are up to things or not up to things or basically some something's up. <laughs> So he, because no one else will do it, is basically investigating this. And there's people that don't want him investigating this. And so having this kind of like conspiracy plot, which again feels very Sean Le Carre, where like the government, like who is doing what in the government and who can you trust and why are things shady? Meanwhile, like horrific nightmarish creatures from the misery. It's just, it's so good. <laughs> it's so freaking good. What is not to like about that? Tell me. What is not to like? Number two on my list is Red Rising by Pierce Brown. No one is surprised. I love Red Rising. I don't know if it's in frame, but I have like more editions than any human should have of the Red Rising books. I've met Pierce Brown three times. I intend to meet him again when the next book comes out, which I very much hope it will come out soon. And I very much hope that pandemic life will allow for events again. Red Rising, what can I even say that I haven't already said about Red Rising? It is compelling, it is immersive, it is unique, it is a space opera that feels like a Greek tragedy and also a fantasy. It has some of the most compelling characters, it has some of the most shocking twists and turns, in particular Golden Sun is one of my, it's on my top 10 list, uh, my list of top 10 books of all time. The experience of reading Golden Sun is an experience. I love how he weaves in all, it's very apparent, like his influences, his interest in politics and in geopolitical history and in Roman and Greek 
history and in Greek classics and in Dune. Dune comes into the new books more, but definitely influences from Dune. I recently read Shadow and Claw, which is the first two books in the Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, which I know is an influence on Pierce Brown. And now having read that, I can see those influences as well in Red Rising. It's just, it's kind of a unique project. I've never read anything like Red Rising. It's amazing. And it's kind of an amazing fandom too. And the, just like the excitement and diehardness of the fans. And Pierce Brown himself is like very good with the fans. So it's just like, it's like a lot of fun to be a part of in so much, in so far as you can be a part of, you know, a fandom. It's just great. It's great. And number one on the list, say it with me now, First Law Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. Do I need to explain this? I have an entire playlist on my channel that has all the videos that I've made that pertain to Joe Abercrombie and the First Law. The First Law Trilogy is the best so far. I, I mean, the new trilogy is not complete yet. And the rules for this list were that it has to be complete and then I have to com have completed reading it. If I make this list again in, you know, a few months or a year, very possibly the Age of Madness will boot First Law Trilogy off and replace it. Because his new books, much like Pierce Brown's new books, I mean, it's not a new trilogy, it's just a continuation of the saga. So Pierce Brown's situation is slightly different. Both Pierce Brown and Joe Abercrombie have impressed and delighted me with the fact that their writing craft has only improved. I'm just like, oh, I'm so glad you guys didn't like shoot the wad on your early work. You guys are improving and growing and it is a delight to see. But yeah, first law trilogy, Glockta, Logan, Giselle, Artie, Pharaoh. I love, 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 love the first law trilogy. Of all of the books on this list, I've read the first law trilogy the most. I've read the first law trilogy in its entirety three times and I've read the blade itself four times. I love the fuck out of it. Of course, it's number one on the list. And God tier. Yeah, I tricked you. There's 11 on this list. But I've said multiple times about this, that it shouldn't go on lists that it can't be compared to other things, that it's on its own level, it's in its own category, it, sh it cannot be discussed with other things. And that's why it couldn't be one through 10 on this list. It doesn't belong on a list. It is God tier. And that is the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. I have a whole video on the Broken Earth Trilogy. I was recently on World Hoppers um, where we talked about N.K. Jemisin. I know I just said that, you know, Red Rising is really unique and it is, but Broken Earth, I have literally never in my life read anything like Broken Earth. It defies comparison, it defies explanation, it defies, it, it defies everything. I was completely gobsmacked by that trilogy. I remain gobsmacked by that trilogy. I question whether N.K. Jemisin is an ordinary mortal human because she's written that and I'm just like, wow, 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 wow. Wow. I don't have words. Most of my video on Broken Earth was me being like, I can't explain it because it can't be explained. I can't describe it because it can't be described. It has to be experienced. And uh, since then I haven't come up with anything. It's not like since then I'm like, oh, you know, I finally come up with a way to explain it. Nope, have to read it. It is just, if you want to talk about groundbreaking, boundary defying, just amazingness, Broken Earth on its own list, its own tier. It is over here. <laughs> Here's everybody else. Broken Earth is over here. So let me know in the comments down below how you feel about the trilogies on my list. If you agree or disagree with me, if uh, there were any surprises or if you could have definitely predicted this whole list, maybe not the precise order, but like you're like, yep, if you were playing bingo, you got them all. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined and I'll see you when I see you.